Raspberry Pi is making their own SSD and microSD cards now, along with a whole boatload of other accessories. They sent me a care package with this 26 Tops AI Hat Plus, an AI camera, and even the strange little slab of black silicone, which in my opinion is the most useful thing I've seen Raspberry Pi make this year. I'll get to why. But why is Raspberry Pi focused on all these accessories right now? I mean, just looking at their website, you can see they already make a bunch of accessories. They make a keyboard and mouse, they make a seven inch touchscreen, they make a bunch of hats, like a TV hat for receiving TV signals, audio hats, a DAC for audio input and output, a sense hat, they make cables and cases, they make the active cooler for the Pi 5. Uh, they even make tons of different camera modules, the V2, the V3, the HQ, and now also the AI camera. This AI camera targets a pretty specific use case. Um, I probably won't be covering this in depth, but the use case for this thing is if you have a lower power Pi, like a Pi Zero or a Pi 3 or something like that, and you want AI on it to identify people's faces or pose detection or things, it puts the AI into the camera itself and sends that over the wire to the Pi instead of having the Pi process it on a CPU or instead of having to use a PCIe dongle, which only works on the Pi 5. Um, the way that they do it is kind of neat. Uh, if I did cover this, I'd go more into depth, but basically under the camera sensor, there's an RP2040 microcontroller that kind of communicates back with the Pi over the CSI connection. And inside of the sensor is a Sony AI integration. It's part of that Atrios thing that they talked about a few years back. Um, but I haven't really had time to test this, and I might at some point, but it, it's not something that I need in any of my projects. So right now I'm just kind of putting this on the shelf. Um, but if you do want to see a demo of this working uh, with things like object detection and pose estimation, check out Kevin Macler's video. I'll drop a link in the description. What's more interesting to me is the more generic AI Hat Plus that works with any camera, not just the AI camera. I already covered the AI kit in June, and you can go watch that video. I'll link to it. Um, I even used uh, a couple Halo modules that they sent, and I built a 55 Tops Pi. I said it was faster than the Copilot Plus PC, and I put that up on this channel, so I'll link to that too. Um, but there's actually two versions of this hat. There's one with the Halo 8L. That's the same chip that was used in the earlier AI kit. That has 13 tops of neural compute power or whatever. That one's 70 bucks. Um, and then this one is the 26 tops version that has the Halo 8. It's basically like a more powerful NPU. Now this one's 110 bucks. But the big difference is that instead of being on like a little M.2 chip that you put into the hat, this is integrated into the hat. It's one PCB for everything. And the reason why that's helpful for some people is that the integrated PCB means that the, the chip can use the PCB as like a, a larger surface area to dissipate heat. On the flip side, it's a little bit less flexible than the AI kit because if you're not doing an AI project, you can't just pop that out and use the, the hat for other M.2 adapters. So for me, I, I probably won't end up using this in a project. I'll probably test it out a little bit more. Uh, but for me, I'm going to be upgrading my Pi NVR from a video that I posted on my main channel. Uh, and I'll probably upgrade that with Pineboard's Hat AI Duo, which has an NVMe slot and a slot for a Halo adapter. This is good for the people that use it. It's, it's kind of a little bit niche, just like the AI camera, because it's, it's a one-trick pony. You can't use the, reuse the hat for something else. This is just for AI. Uh, but for people that need it, uh, that'll be great. If, if you just need to have an NPU on the Pi that can process a lot more data or have multiple camera streams or do multiple passes on an image or something like that, that's what this is for. I do wish that the M.2 versions of these Halo NPUs were a little bit more available. Uh, because it would be nice to buy the AI kit and then upgrade later if you want, instead of having to switch out hats entirely. Uh, but we'll see if that happens. But in terms of my favorite accessory, it's this, the Raspberry Pi bumper. It's uh, it's literally kind of like a sock that goes on the bottom of the Pi. I'll, I'll show you how it works here. Uh, you just kind of pop it on, and uh, that's it. It's uh, It goes on the bottom of the Pi, and it has a space for the micro SD card here. And it keeps it keeps the Pi from sliding around on your desk when you're doing when you're tinkering with it. It also has space for the active cooler, so that the little clips that go in they can go through and it won't push push through the bottom. And it has a little bit of ventilation on the bottom. It's uh, it's not rocket science. It's not crazy. It also I just noticed has a little. Uh, uh, cut out for where you can press the button. I'm excited about this because it's just like a practical, helpful, everyday thing for somebody who tinkers with pies a lot. I have them on my desk all the time, and what I've done in the past, 
And this is one of the pies that I use on my desk a lot uh, with one of Argon's Thermal 30 AC coolers on it. People keep asking me, like, what is that? That's not the active cooler. What I do is I take these, these little rubber feet and I stick them on the bottom of the pie like this. Uh, but the problem is that I can't, there's, there's nowhere to put them really that doesn't cover up a circuit somewhere. And it makes the pie a little bit lopsided. They worked, but I think that I'm going to be picking up a few of these bumpers and I'm just going to stick them on the bottom of most of my Pi 5s. Because if you don't have them in a case, it's nice to have uh, something to hold it steady when you're plugging things in and unplugging. Anyway, it's pretty cheap, and I think that, <laughs> I mean, in my opinion, this is the best product Raspberry Pi has made this year. Now, that would change immediately if Raspberry Pi made a GPU dock for the Pi 5. Uh, did I tell you, by the way, that we got this guy working on the Pi 5? I don't know when a video on that will come, uh, but we're still working out some driver bugs, and we're also finding that there's ways we might be able to get some of this stuff upstreamed into Linux. We'll see. Back to something a lot more practical, Raspberry Pi is selling their own microSD cards again. They used to sell noobs cards with PiOS pre-installed, but they stopped making those after they created the network installer. The, really, the reason for that was because people would buy a Pi and they would have to have another computer to flash it, but now that you can flash it over the internet, it's not as big a deal. But these have a special purpose. First of all, there's a 32 gig for 11 bucks, 64 gigs for 13 bucks. Those are the two that I have here. And then there's 128 gigs. I don't know how much it'll be, maybe 15 or 16, I don't know. Uh, but these are all manufactured by Longsys, which is a Chinese company that makes a lot of storage products. It, it's funny, when I was tearing down the Qualcomm dev kit, uh, its NVMe drive was also made by Longsys. Uh, rest in peace to the dev kit. Uh, but the big feature on these is A2 class command Q support. It's something that you have to support in the Pi firmware. So these aren't the only cards that'll work with it. I actually have some other cards from other manufacturers with A2 support, and I've been testing those in the past. And uh, the big thing is command queuing. I, I wrote about this way back in 2019 on my blog. That was before I did a video about these kind of things on my YouTube channel. But I wrote that A2 class micro SD cards offer no better performance for the Raspberry Pi back then in 2019. A2 support is still kind of a mess. Not all cards that are stamped with A2 actually support all the features that A2 is supposed to have, uh, but some of them work with command queuing, some of them don't. There's a forum thread that you can go on to look at, at uh, different people's experiences, but these Pi cards do, and uh, they're also tested with Pi OS, and that's a nice thing to have. I'm not gonna go over all the performance details and testing and all that with these things. If you want that, uh, brett.dk has a full review with benchmarks and all that. It's nice, it's, it's good to have, it's nice that they sell these. These are pretty much guaranteed to work with the Pi's command queuing versus other cards, which may or may not. And I think SanDisk, uh, the SanDisk Extreme cards are still going to be faster than these, but these are pretty fast and they're good and they'll be available probably wherever Pi's are sold, which is nice. But I still like sticking with NVMe when I can because it is, it's even faster than that and it's more reliable and, you know, you can get a lot more storage per chip. And speaking of NVMe's, Raspberry Pi is actually selling their own NVMe's now. All of these are in 2230 size. Uh, most NVMe drives are 2280, they're a bit longer. Uh, some are 2242, and 2230 is a little bit more rare, but it's useful when space is at a premium. Like, if, you know, if you look at the Steam Deck or other portable devices, they usually use this size. Uh, you can get the 256 gig, that's this one, for 30 bucks. You can get 512 gigs for 45 bucks, but that one I don't think will be available for a week or two. And uh, there are other Pi-focused SSDs, like the Cytron makes the Maker Disk and Pineboards makes the Pine Drives. And I'll talk about how those are a little different uh, than this one. One thing that I noticed when, when this was announced, they didn't really announce things like all the specs, like how many PCIe lanes it can support. If you don't use it in a Pi, it can be faster. Uh, the maximum performance uh, metrics on a faster machine than a Pi. Things like the total bytes written or uh, mean time between failure. Uh, those specs can be useful if you're going to deploy this out in the field somewhere on a Pi that's going to run for five years. You want to know those specs, um, especially if you're doing industry work and things like that. So it'd be nice to get that information. You know, Pine Boards actually includes all those specs. Uh, Cytron includes some of those. Um, they even have like shock ratings and stuff like that. And I asked Raspberry Pi about why they aren't releasing all those specs. And they said that they're basically putting out the minimum specification uh, because they, if they ever have to switch suppliers for the actual chip on this thing, they want to make sure that their minimum specs are still met, and if they publish exact numbers, then it could cause problems down the line. I get why they want to do that. Um, you know, they don't want to pu publish specs, and then a year later, if they change it, 
and something's like 2% slower, they don't want people yelling at them about it. And this happens with storage devices. There's a lot of storage devices and drives and things that they switch the individual chips and it can change the performance of it. And a lot of times manufacturers just won't tell you what happened and they'll sell you a cheaper product at the same high price <laughs> and that's not good. So I, you know, I get why they're doing that. But we can still check what this thing does and what chip it has using tools in Linux. So I did that. I, I ran LSPCI and I found that this is a four lane uh, PCIe Gen 3 device. And uh, with all four lanes, you should be able to get one to two gigabytes per second with this drive on sequential reads. On the Pi, it'll top route around 800 megabytes per second uh, because it only has one lane. Um, but I did plug it into my Pi 5. I ran all my benchmarks. Uh, I could get almost 200,000 random read IOPS and 90,000 random write. And, uh, you know, sequential throughput is going to max out the Pi's bus, 800 megabytes per second. And I can also use NVMe CLI to find out all the details. Like this is a Samsung chip. It has all the NVMe features you'd want. Uh, it, it can do smart and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's a pretty good SSD. It's um, For the price, it's, it's fine. But I think going back to the main topic of this video, why are they making SSDs and micro SD cards at all? There are already tons of these things on the market. And the main reason that I see is it's guaranteed compatibility with the Pi. Uh, the Pi community and myself included has tested tons of SSDs. We found a lot that don't really work well on the Pi's PCI Express bus. And uh, sometimes even the same model of drive, like if you buy a WD Blue and then buy another one a year later, the same model might work with certain firmware revisions, but not others because they change out chips on them or they update the firmware on them. Uh, and it's the same story sometimes with micro SD cards. Uh, if you just see A1 or A2 on the card, that doesn't mean it'll actually be reliable at the speeds the Pi is capable of now. So it's nice to have kind of a baseline. Like this is this is the fully supported micro SD card. They also support these things for 10 years, which isn't something that all SSD manufacturers do. A lot of them keep spamming out new models every year and you have to follow a moving target if you design a product using one of their drives. Stability over time is one of Raspberry Pi's main selling points and that seems to extend to their accessories too. Now, some of these things will be showing up in other videos too. I, I just don't have the time to review every single one of these. Some people are like, oh, you're the Raspberry Pi guy on YouTube. It's like, I'm not really. I just like Raspberry Pis and use them in a lot of projects and they show up all the time. But the larger problem is Raspberry Pi has been sending all these things. Like I, I got a box with like five of these in them yesterday. And I'm like, I don't have the time to review all these things and test them and, and give my honest opinion because giving an honest opinion might require 20 or 30 hours of work of making sure I follow every little thing that I find that's weird or every little bug or every little interesting feature. Um, so what I'd say is if you do want to see more information about these, there's a lot of makers on YouTube these days that will review these things or have reviewed them already. So please go subscribe to their channels. Uh, there's Lee PSP, there's Kevin McAleer, there's uh, Brett.dk. There's a bunch of other people who are covering these things. And not, none of us can cover all these things, but in aggregate, one of us usually covers every single thing. So I'll leave a list of some channels I follow in the description. I'll see you next time.